Okay, before I uh, start, I just wanted the Lord just been speaking in my heart, and I just want to speak prophetically today over all of this. I just sense the uh, Father is saying, My children, my children, oh, how I love you so much. And I've made a place for you, and I've made a way for you. And I'm asking you today to come to me, to lay your burdens down that I can give you that rest. I have never intended for you to struggle, but I've made a way for you. So come to me and receive from me, and I will give you the peace and the rest that you so desire. Thank you, Father. Um, so we're going to go through something here today, and I really am believing that today you will walk in a new sense of freedom. So uh, let's go to the next slide. Right. So I'm the this. Uh, oops, sorry. This talk. Let me go back. Apologies. The uh, talk that I am uh, sharing. Whose standard are you living by? And just to think about which standard have we got for our lives? So uh, there's a little bit of recap and a little bit of uh, stuff going here. So. Um, let's just go through some uh, information that might be helpful. Um, what is very exciting today, there's a lot of scientific research and the evidence today is proving scripture more and more to be the truth. And I, it's absolutely fascinating. Stuff that was written thousands and thousands of years ago has been scientifically proven today. What we've got to remember, we are created a spirit soul and body. You'll find this in Thessalonians 5.23. And the Greek word for soul is suchi or suche. And um, our word psychology is derived from that word. And our soul is of three aspects. Our emotional aspect, our mind, our thinking aspect, um, and our cognition, the choice or our will aspect. So there's a couple of diagrams here. So we've got to remember we live simultaneously in two realms and those that have seen some of the earlier presentations might recognize this slide. So there we are, spirit, soul and body. So we live in the carnal realm. Now there has been quite a lot of use of that word carnal. And I don't think we need to be so fearful of that because it really means pertaining to the body. And as in the spirit realm, there can be negative spiritual influence and positive in influence. So in the carnal realm, there is both negative and positive. So when we use the word carnal, uh, be a little bit tender to yourself that it's it's not necessarily wrong that you are hungry that you desire certain types of food that you have certain relationships that are precious for you that you love doing certain things so the carnal realm is the realm of our five senses and then the spiritual realm is the realm of the Holy Spirit, which we've been talking about quite a bit recently as well. And this is another slide because our soul is integrally linked to the body and we are in this time space continuum on planet Earth. So where we have our spirit, our soul with the three emotions and our body. So we're going to look a little bit more at our body because we live in a body all the time everything we do everything that happens around us happens through the body our nervous system in our body was created by god for survival it's a most incredible 
fascinating uh, thing that is ever created is our human body and how it responds. So we have a nervous system and that goes right up into our brain. Now, I don't know if you know, but our brain consists of a lower part, which is all about keeping us safe. That happens automatically. You've got very, well, you've got no control of it, really. It is just responds very quickly in seven milliseconds. And God created this uh, part of our brains to keep us alive. So suddenly you, somebody steps out while you drive in the car. Before you can think of your, uh, from your upper brain, which is slow acting, your lower brain kicks in and you hit the brakes before you can think about it. So our lower brain has been created by God for us to survive in this world that we live in. Now, what we've got to remember, we've got different type of memories. So there's two words that we use is an explicit memory, and then we have an implicit memory. An explicit memory is something that you can actually remember. Um, so you might remember your last birthday, or you might remember uh, the last time you got together with your friends. You can remember very clearly that. But then we have implicit memories that we can't really recall, but they are there and they're working. So if you drive a car and the last time you drove a car, can you remember as an explicit memory, how many times you put your feet, foot on the clutch, the brake, or the accelerator. When you, if you can ride a bicycle, and I think all of us probably can, when you get on the bicycle, you don't have to really think about that. Once you've got your implicit memories, you get on the bicycle, and you can ride that bicycle, and you can even have a conversation, you can even look around and not uh, wobble too much. And obviously, if there's nothing in the way, you won't crash. So we've got these implicit memories and these implicit memories are recorded in the body and in the nervous system and it links to the lower brain. And this all happens automatically. You cannot stop it. So when we go on, we look a little bit here at ourselves. This is a human being. So what we have, we have sensory information through the eyes, through sound, through touch, through taste, through our smell. And as this information comes into our nervous system, these implicit memories begin to also get mingled with what we are seeing, experiencing. So your traumas that you might have gone through, which can be a birth trauma that you can't even remember. There can be traumas that you might have experienced in the womb that you can't remember, but they implicit, they, they're in your body. Then you've also got your scripts, the things that were told to you by your family. This is how you behave. This is how you do things. This is, you know, we have scripts of in our cultural, when a person of importance stands up, you speak to them this way, you speak to your mom that way, you speak to your dad, you speak to your uncle. There's a whole lot of implicit scripts that we have and culturally they can change. And then you've got your own personal experiences, um, which can be quite uh, enjoyable and also can be quite difficult. Um, we've got experiences, Margie and I, of moving from a, where we uh, were first living in Cape Town to George. And we had this experience of our furniture lorry overturning on the main highway and go in there and see all our furniture on the side of the road. It is an experience, a little bit traumatic. Anyhow, that's all locked inside our memories. Then that, as you get this information coming in, mingled with all these other things, it goes to our lower brain, which I have mentioned before, and that responds in seven milliseconds. Quicker than you can flick your finger, your lower brain, has responded. From then, the information is further sent up to your upper brain. Now, I don't know if you've seen a 
picture of the brain, but your upper brain or cortex. There's a left side, which is uh, all sequential processing, and the right side, which is your emotional processing. So the information comes up, goes to the lower brain, goes to the left brain, goes to the right brain. And then we've got in the front of our head on our forehead here, our prefrontal cortex. And that monitors what is happening inside our lower brain and our body, and also in the space around us. So let's just have a little simple example here. You all sit in, you're listening, and suddenly there is a terrific bang outside. You, the sound would come in, that would be triggered if you've experienced a accident with a similar uh, bang, would immediately go up into your lower brain. Your lower brain would say, whoa, you are in danger. It would respond, kicking in your adrenaline, your heart would go, your lungs would glow. But at the same time, the information would further go up to your upper brain. On the left-hand side, that would say, okay, that was the outside, I'm still safe, it's fine. Your right-hand side of your brain will say, oh, I wonder if somebody's hurt, must I go and help? So this thing is happening within us almost without us being able to control it in any way. So here's how it would work, and this is exactly the same thing. We have this event through our senses, and it goes, first of all, through a thalamus. The thalamus is a part of the brain that filters out unwanted noise. So right now, where you are, you might be here in a bus or a train or a dog barking, but your thalamus will say, that's not important, and it just filters out. The information then goes into the upper brain and the lower brain. The upper brain, rational thinking, slow. Your lower brain has got a thing called an amygdala, and that is something like a smoke detector. Its function of a smoke detector is to detect smoke and sound and alarm. It doesn't do any rational thinking, whether the smoke is from a building that's 10 miles away or a fire in the, in the room. It will just act without processing. The result is the alarm and the threat will cause us to panic or overreact. So this is the body that we are living in that God created. So this is scripture now. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? Well, that's from Jeremiah. So what I sense the Lord is saying, hold on, you've experienced a whole lot of things and often we react in a way that we don't want to react because we are reacting out of these things. Uh, so we can think, we want to, as you all said, I want to be calm, I want to be peaceful, I want to get my tasks done. But then something pops up from your heart and whoa, uh, we find that we are reacting in a way that we really don't want to react in. And then out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And I'm pretty sure that all of us have experienced the uh, situation where something popped out of our mouth before, before we could say anything. And say, oh, I didn't mean to say it that way. So I want to give you an illustration here. So I've got this little coffee table and it's got a broken leg. And I want to use this table because the table is intended to balance, uh, to put things on. So I can do it by balancing it over those three legs there. So you come to visit me one day and I'm very excited and you're sitting down and I come in with the tray of the tea, the coffee, the biscuits, the milk, the sugar, and I'm so excited, I inadvertently put the tray over the broken leg. And of course, the table collapses. Can I be angry with the table? No. I know it's got a broken leg. I know it cannot stand. 
Now I ask you the question. Well, I say make a statement. God is omniscient and knows everything about all of us. The, min the, the, the minutest of details from what happened at conception, when your mother discovered she was pregnant, at your birth, what happened after birth, all the way through every moment of your life, your Father in heaven knows. And he knows where the broken leg is. And when we collapse because we've got a broken leg, he's not caught out. When I made a big mess up the other day, he didn't oh, slap his head and say, oh my, what's Meryl doing now? I can't believe he did that. The scripture says that even before a word is on my mouth, he knows it. Now here's our problem. We have these broken legs. We all got these broken legs. And we try to prop them up. We try to fix it ourselves. And what we should be doing is going to the carpenter and get the leg fixed. Now we can begin to understand why there is now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. He does not have an expectation of us to be able to perform where we cannot perform. He's not caught about, about that. But there is God's part in this and there's our part. And what we have to be very careful of is not trying to do God's part. God's part is to restore us right through scripture. His heart is restoration, 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 restoration. Our part is to go to him. So I'm going to give you a testimony. This is my personal testimony. I've got a couple like this. So I got born again in 1986 at the age of 40. And it was in those years where I used to service my own motor vehicle. It was the days of points and plugs and tappets. And whenever I worked on the car, the language was blue, as blue as blue can be. If you know what I mean by that, I was cussing and swearing. And I could not stop myself. And I made a decision. I said, I don't want to swear. When I work on a car, I swear. I don't want to swear. I'm not going to work on the car anymore. And I just left it like that. And God is so gracious and good, you know. And it was a couple of months where something went wrong with the car and I had to fix it. And I went there, and as I was working, I suddenly realized I wasn't cussing anymore. Somehow, somewhere, God had changed my heart. Maybe I didn't explicitly ask him, but internally my heart was saying, Lord, I don't want to behave like this. I don't want to be, be like that. And he came along, and he changed my heart. And when we begin to realize we can't change ourselves, but we can go to the carpenter who can, because he's made a way for us to go to the carpenter. I want to give you another little illustration so that we get a, begin to get an understanding of who we are in our Father's heart. So just imagine for a moment, you've got a beautiful diamond that's flawless, that's the size of a tennis ball. And I'm going to ask you 
to put some sort of a value on that diamond. Maybe you want to put a billion pounds, whatever it is. Let's say it's a billion pounds, right? This is your diamond. It's worth a billion. I'm going to take your diamond and I'm going to put it in a bucket of water. What's its value now? No, it's a million pounds. The diamond is flawless. Okay, so I'm going to take your diamond, I'm going to put it in dirty engine oil, greasy oil. Has its value changed? No, it's just dirty on the outside. Inside, the value has not changed. If I take your diamond and I put it in a block of concrete, has the value of the diamond changed? No, might be locked away, but the value of the diamond is still a billion pounds. I can take your diamond and I can put it in the worst stinky muck that you could ever think of. The value of the diamond has never changed. You are that diamond. That's how the Father sees you. Beautiful, precious. Yes, we might be covered with muck, but he can clean it off. And that's how he views you. And I want to suggest to you today that you start seeing yourself in that light of this precious diamond. So I ask you, are you criticizing, condemning yourself? Because he's certainly not. Which standard, whose standard are you living by? Your standard or the Father's standard? Because what we need to do is live by the Father's standard. Therefore, there is now no condemnation in Christ Jesus because we are in him. Now remember these following points. This world is a broken world. And therefore we can never be perfect in this imperfect world system. Before I came to know the Lord, I'd grown up with an Eastern philosophy of karma and reincarnation and all the rest. And I was, in my family of origin, the scripts was, you got to be perfect. I received my freedom when I realized I cannot be perfect. And God does not expect me to be perfect because it's a broken world. We'll never be perfect in this world. So stop trying to be perfect. But we can be holy. And holiness is being consecrated to a, person, to, to a purpose. Be it a cup in the temple, showbread, or ourselves. We can be consecrated. Even though we are broken, we can still be holy because it is written, be holy because I am holy. It's, holiness is just consecration to the purposes of God. And in this world system, this is our heart. We might not get it right, but there is now no condemnation. I've got a little prayer that I would like to suggest you pray with me as we come to a close. If you have condemned yourself in any way, criticized yourself, beaten yourself up, I would like you to pray with me this prayer. And it begins, and let us pray, pray together. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. 
Lord, these negative words and curses that I have spoken over myself, words of criticism, words of condemnation, are not the fruit of the Holy Spirit. I confess them as sin. I now say as Jesus said, Father, forgive me, for I did not know what I was doing. Now I choose to forgive myself. I am releasing myself and setting myself free to be me. And as a result, I am now free to be who you created me to be. Father, I believe in you. And I believe you have the power to set me free. I ask you to change me. I am unable to help you with the process. And I'm totally dependent upon you. Create in me a pure heart, O oh God. And renew a right spirit within me. I ask that you by your Holy Spirit in me, will open the eyes of my heart to see things from your perspective. Give me your revelation about me as your redeemed child, so that by a new understanding, my attitudes and thinking are changed. Lord, I thank you for purifying.